Hello, and welcome to the fifth part of my six part series on sustainable agriculture. Today, I'm going to be talking about agroecology. So agroecology began really in the 1970s, and it, it emerged as a sort of scientific approach to designing agricultural systems, systems that essentially mimic the natural systems of a given area in order to increase efficiency and sustainability. The significance of local farmer knowledge would became really quickly recognized among the in innovators of agroecology. And one of the first thinkers to advance this idea of agroecology was Efren Fernandez Zolokotsi, sorry, pronunciation, who, and he from, from the 1940s right through the 1970s, he essentially worked to advance this idea that cultural practices construct agroecological knowledge through an interchange of ecological science and through people's knowledge. The focus then of agroecology as a movement was first centered in Mexico as part of this broader movement to resist the so-called green revolution that I talked about earlier. It was also influenced by developments south of the border. So the American scholars, Miguel Altieri and Stephen Glissman became these well-known proponents of agroecology and the struggles also for a more sustainable vision of agriculture in the United States. At the same time, other scholars like Pierre Rabi drew international attention by running agroecology training sessions in France and in West Africa through the 1980s. All of these theorists uh, asserted an indigenous worldview and they advanced also a life affirming ethic for the earth. In essence, um, agroecology seeks to combine the modern ecological science with this also this experiential knowledge that's held by farmers and indigenous people who are educated in their own agrarian culture. There is this recognition then in agroecology that local knowledge and traditional land management practices include are perhaps the most effective and sustainable responses to the challenges of a specific area. Um, this is also based on the understanding that such knowledge is grounded in hundreds, if not even thousands of years of observation of how adaptive, of adaptive and dynamic processes in the land. So the principles of agroecology are complex, but they are grounded in this notion that human, animal, and plant systems are all fundamentally tied together and they function best when they are nurtured in this within that type of relationship. So the Food and Agriculture Organization of the, the FAO, they describe 10 elements of agroecology. And these include diversity, co-creation of knowledge, synergy, efficiency, recycling, resilience, human and social values culture and food traditions, responsible governance, and circular and solidary economy. So each of these elements in some way then highlights the need to integrate human culture, human cultural values with ecological values. So agroecologists then tend to advance this notion that applying these elements depends on the recognition that also that modernity and industrialization undermines the traditional agrarian systems and basically also undermines the ability to use resources that conserve, like resource conserving technologies as well. So agroecology then is centered within the traditions of locally specific farming knowledge. It also provides for an affordable and also highly productive, but and ecologically sound alternative 
to the models, the dominant models of agriculture that we see today. Agriculture, agroecology is a, a movement then that also works toward building a new form of relating, of a relating to each other. So in some sense, it's a social movement. It recognizes that relations have, relationships have fundamental consequences for how we relate to the earth. So how we treat each other has consequences for how we treat the earth. Agroecology is also seen as a form of challenging the dominant hierarchical power structures that exist in our society. It's really about the ground up approach and an egalitarian, building an egalitarian type of society. It is similar to food sovereignty movements in that it questions the structure of powers that control the production and distribution of food and they're linked to the environmental injustices that are associated with capitalism. Agroecology is also closely linked to feminist concerns because the industrial food system tends to place much more control in the hands of fewer people. And these are predominantly male farmers. Whereas in, in reality, the majority of smallholder farmers in the world are in fact women. And they are still responsible for producing a large share of the food across the world, particularly in less industrialized countries. So as we have seen earlier in this lecture, the industrial food system then tends to destroy forests and wetlands and wild habitats in favor of these Western style farming operations. But women in particular, but of course, others as well, and, and women, uh, I'm sorry, and indigenous populations, they really rely on the ecosystems in different ways. They rely on them for food, they rely on them for medicine, and for different types of energy that they need to feed their families. So agro, agroecology then uh, recognizes this critical role that women in particular play in sustainably managing ecosystems over the long term. And that's why I say that it's a social movement because it really brings into the fore, into everyone who's involved in food production. But, and so without, without effort to really give voice to these people, particularly women, the goals of agroecology agro are really not recognized because it's not just a farm-based initiative or farm-based movement. And there are a number of examples of agroecology that can be found throughout the world. And I, I'm not, I don't have time to go into all of these, but just to give you a sense, but there is urban farming, organic agriculture, and even indoor farms. And these farms tend to try to create this autonomous system within an in enclosed environment. But, and also these environments, they try to seek, they seek basically to mimic the processes of natural environments using both traditional methods and using modern methods as well. So some of the probably the most promising forms of agroecology that we see are in agro, agroforestry and particularly in Central America. And there's been this move away from the slash and burn agriculture that we have seen there towards more agroforestry practices. And agroforestry essentially uses a diverse array of trees to help build up nutrient dense soils and to create a canopy that helps retain water, it reduces erosion, um, it preserves native species of plants and animals, and also creates a diversified source of income for farmers. And livestock are also can be used as part of this system as part to provide fertilizers, natural fertilizers to the agroforestry system. A, another important example is the chinampas in Mexico. And they use several principles of agroforestry because they're basic, but they are unique in that they are developed using wetlands and they're, they're built essentially on the bottom of a lake bed. 
And here's a, a picture of Chinampas, but you can do your own research on them. And in, in Canada, we have another example here of indigenous rice farming, which is also uh, done on, on lake beds, using lake environments to apply the principles of agroecology. So of course, those are just a few of the examples. There are hundreds, but I will let you do that research. So over time, the focus of agroecology though has expanded to, to include a way of critically analyzing the global food system and also broadening, broadening the scope of alternative food networks in order to sort of relocalize food production and consumption. So farm organizations and consumer advocacy groups and also social movements, they cite these principles of agroecology in a way that they want to create a new vision for an alternative model that really is outside of the industrial model that is so problematic. So in a, in a really detailed study by Glasman that came out in 2018, the, the, the team of researchers, they looked at what are the ways of transitioning towards agroecology and what are some of the limitations of the industrial food model and how these can be overcome through employing these principles of agroecology. And the, so I'm just gonna go over some of these because these are critically important. Uh, in, order, in order to create this more sustainable type of agriculture, it is really imperative that we employ these principles. And I've listed them here, but I will give you a little bit more insight into how these work. So the first is community-led governance. In community-led governance, basically we develop structures of engagement that reinforce a bottom-up approach. And that means that we're creating incentives that support sharing of locally-based knowledge, where we go to community and, and, and try to build knowledge through community networks, and also initiate, initiating community-led consultations instead of consultations run by government. So the consultations will actually be run by community, and then, and then that information is passed on to governments or governments are invited to be part of that consultation effort. The second one here is develop new roles for key actors. So this means that we're trying to build an inclusive movement by allowing peasant organizations to develop their influence by growing cooperatively and through the markets. And also to create new spaces for farmers to share their knowledge with each other and with government. And to increase the community-based activities and political advocacy as well. Another way to foster agroecology is to create new alliances across farmer, consumer, and environmental groups. So this is a way to sort of leverage new opportunities for actors to apply the principles of agroecology and to invite new actors to participate in these initiatives. Another is to draw attention to the cultural narratives. And this is very important. In, we need to ensure that measures that are taken are deeply rooted in the cultural narratives of a specific place. It needs to respect the worldviews and the local identity of the people that are trying to grow the food there. And we also need to focus on the deeply rooted stories of the people and how they influence land and water management. And this is really tied to food sovereignty, giving people a voice and giving them, empowering them to grow food that is culturally sensitive. Also, it means conducting detailed research and analysis of discourses, which is something I talked about earlier, um, in, in terms of looking at what are the, how, what are the impacts of the questions I talked about, the discourses of environmental and, and agricultural practices and how these play into building a new movement. 
We also need to relocalize the food system when it is possible. So that doesn't mean, of course, that we're going to dismantle the global food system tomorrow, but it means that we need to look at ways to foster the connections to local markets and cultures and communities. And these, these can include things like home gardens, farmers market, uh, in farmer to farmer or farmer to consumer movements, CSA as they're called here, direct marketing and local public procurement. We also will need to foster farmer to farmer knowledge sharing. So this is, means that we're going to reject linear extension models where we're just uh, looking for government to feed information to farmers, but to have a really cooperative knowledge sharing structure. It means disseminating farmer knowledge through things like field schools, for, for, through farmer collaborations with universities, and also through these grassroots organizations which are specializing in environmental knowledge dissemination. And finally, and, I, and, and not least importantly, we need to empower young people and women to take leadership roles in these movements. And we need to recognize that young people and women are really critical in developing these strong communities and in developing agricultural farming. So in the next lecture, at the last and final lecture, I'm just going to give you a sense of where we can go with this. What are the possible futures for sustainable agriculture?